everyone, and welcome to the Listening to Smile podcast. My name is Ian Morris, and I'm here with Sam Pukathos. Is that, did I pronounce that right? Okay, awesome. Yeah. And um, Sam has recently come in to work with Listening to Smile Records and become a good friend, and I'm just really excited to have him here today um, so that we can talk about his journey and some of the things that really relate to all things in our stratosphere, which is art, music, mental health, um, well-being, holistic care, and then also sound and frequency. And so, Sam, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I would just really love to jump in um, and really get started and talk about what I think is on everyone's mind from time to time uh, in our hero journey, which is worthiness. Um, and then also just the value that we're adding to the world and how that comes about for a lot of people that is either through sickness or some kind of strife or struggle uh, internally, that conflict that really leads us to that place where we find those gifts that not only help us, but then we're able to share with the world. So could you, for our listeners, could you explain to people kind of who you are, what you do, and then kind of get started on what brought you here to this moment? Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, Ian, Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to both have been collaborating with you over the last few months uh, with listening to Smile Records and then for the the, the bigger piece that we're, we're creating, uh, which we, we might talk about at some point. Um, and, you know, to be able to share more about the journey and also just the, the power of what sound frequencies can really do um, to optimize anything in terms of what people want to create in their life and any aspect of the human condition. So in terms of what brought me here, like my background has... You know, I've always been a very curious person. I I can't remember a time where I wasn't obsessed with asking questions, I especially remember as a kid, just asking my dad, what does that mean? What does this mean? And almost seeing him as the uh, the guru and like looking to him for any answer in life. There was some point in where I realized, you know, there are other ways to find answers. Um, but for a long time, that was my my way of being. And I was surrounded by academics at the dinner table from a young age. Like my parents had great dinner parties and they would bring in uh, philosophers, political theorists, economists, Shakespeare scholars, experts on the Middle East, and I would just sort of sit there and soak up the conversation. So I think that really engaged my curiosity at a pretty young age. And at some point I discovered like, okay, I'm pretty good at this thing called philosophy. And then that started this path of around 20 years of really getting curious about all of the different nuances of the human condition. And that's where I really spent a lot of my time up until about 2017. And 2017 was kind of a pivotal moment. I'd gone through a period of struggle around my own mental health, my own well being, and my own kind of sense of identity. Like I knew I had a lot of potential as an academic, but some shape or form, I wasn't fulfilling it. You know, I was obsessed with the Scottish philosopher David Hume. I could talk to you for hours about it. But when it came to the actual delivery of what I was truly trying to say, the perfectionism and trying to get things right aspect of my being at that stage was blocking me from truly being able to fulfill what I wanted to do. And I had such high expectations on myself as to what I was trying to create. I was looking to, to write something which was truly groundbreaking um, in what it was. And that pressure that I put on myself internally kept making it more and more difficult to actually complete this thing. And so when I actually did um, finish the doctorate, it wasn't awarded in 2017. And I really went through a process of trying to figure out who the fuck am I and um, really not liking who I'd become. You know, I felt like a disappeared Sam, like this, the playfulness, the sense of, you know, being great with people, all the things kind of disappeared. And there was almost like this hermit version of me that had taken place, a kind of guy who would be stuck in bed for, you know, weeks at a time not wanting to face the world because there was so much shame and sense of failure, which was present within my experience of life that I just didn't want to see anyone uh, so that they would see kind of how I'd become. So that was kind of the, the key kind of start of the hero's journey, if you like, where things started to have to shift. Yeah. And I started to get into personal development. I didn't know anything about personal development. It wasn't part of my lexicon or my the language in which I spoke, but I started to get a sense of how philosophy could be useful in terms of learning from an ontological 
phenomenological perspective. So we we shifted from the doing aspect of what it was to be a human being to the actual being aspect. And so that became a big part of my new education. Yeah. And it re-inspired me to, you know, you know, write a new version of the doctorate and um start to just re-engage with life in a way where I started to really love it. And from that training in transformative leadership, I started a coaching business. Um, but then I got an opportunity to work with someone who had impacted tens of millions of lives. And I thought, oh, this is an incredible opportunity. So let me go and do this. And I worked very closely with them for about a nine month period. And I learned a lot in that period. I feel like the nine months that was there was worth like 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I attribute the calmness in which I have now as a consequence of being in an environment, which people would almost describe as like being in the Navy SEALs for high performance. You know, you're really always on in the way in which you're engaging in this uh, environment, but you're also being challenged around your own humanity, your own understanding of who you are as a human being. And anything which triggers you is kind of designed to show up within that space. So it gave me a different kind of understanding of, you know, what are my capabilities? What is my capacity? And it was inconsistent with that idea of fulfilling one's limitless potential. And by the time I left that, I was seeing so much more expansion in terms of what I was truly able to do. But it was still very much in the intellectual, uh, experiential realm in that respect. It wasn't into the somatic at that point. And I think the shift for me was when I actually got an opportunity to do a guided psychedelic journey. It was like an MDMA and psilocybin journey. And that opened up a whole new world because both I, I saw the kind of you know, the best way I describe it was like there was like a God self kind of came through. Like I, I yeah. dealt with all the different challenges within the uh, psychedelic awareness that you have. And then from that space, it's kind of like a creation of space for nothing. And from when there's nothing in the space, you can create anything. And I got access to like, oh, like I had a vision to be able to do work in transforming politics. And in my hallucinatory state, the first person that showed up was the then prime minister of England. And I was coaching him about his father. But I wasn't just coaching him from a soft spoken voice. I was coaching him as if my voice had suddenly amplified by a hundred times. And then that continued on with a number of prolific figures, including the person that I'd supported and worked with. And so that started to make, oh, okay, what is actually possible? But the real uh, thing which was interesting was the kind of message that I got, which is in a way is consistent with what I do now, was Sam, you're here to heal all the bullshit in the world. You know, mm. and I I was kind of in the room doing almost like a snow angel equivalent 50 times over, keep repeating this message because it was so clear, like that was what you're here to do. Yeah. So from there, I decided to train around energy healing, discovered I had a proficiency with that very, very quickly. But I thought, what they're doing there is fine, but all you're doing is getting someone to peace. And peace is actually quite easy to get someone to. It's like, what do you want to do with the peace? So then I started to develop a new process, which would actually take someone from not just wanting peace, but actually what they want to create in life, using that as a mechanism to, uh, to start to bring it forth. And as I evolved through that technology, new kinds of upgrades kind of happened. Like a computer has an upgrade. My... Uh, you know, existing toolkits expanded without me actually trying to, you know, I remember watching a video, which was on commitment by a coach called Steve Hardison. I'd watched this video several times before, but on the third occasion, at one point, I remember stopping it about 75% through and just feeling this sense of frustration. It's like, oh, why can't I do uh, for myself what I'm doing for others? I'm getting these extraordinary results for others, but why, I, why can't I do it for myself? And I remember like basically clapping my hands, creating energy within the hands. And then my arms went out like Jesus on a cross. And the word Jesus would have been a trigger point for me at that stage. And I would never have had my arms go out like that. So um, I didn't think a lot of it, but I just remember the energy coursing through my hands. But the next time I worked with clients, what happened is these breaths started to show up where essentially what I could tell was by the end of a breath, I could see that, oh, peace had come in for that person or something feels like it's physically shifted within them. Like, oh, this pain seems like it's gone. And then I would just check in, is that what's happened for you? And they would tell me, yeah, that's what's happened. So that felt like, oh, wow, I've created this new kind of thing, which people are finding really potent. But then it kind of expanded to this new dimension, probably about a year ago, where I discovered that suddenly I could use sound frequencies through my voice as the actual technology and using breath is fine but it's also very taxing on the body 
And so using voice was way more efficient and effective to be able to create transformation, but also to still have the life force that was needed to be able to, um, you know, keep having the own ease and freedom within one's own life. And yeah. for me, that's kind of been a, a key component. So in terms of what's brought me to here, it's kind of been this journey from you know, philosopher who was trying to discover their true potential to realizing actually there's a lot of things I was good at, which beyond that, but that thread of the human condition stayed throughout as these different modalities got uh, formed until now I've developed this technology, which I call neuro resonance optimization, which is a way of leaders being able to create and fulfill whatever audacious visions they have and to be able to clear any energetic physical, psychological, spiritual, emotional, financial barriers, which stand in the way of them being the kind of leaders that they truly want to be. Yeah. So interesting with everything that you just said, the takeaway for me, um, you know, just as an observer and a listener is we all have these things that kind of push us, you know, some people might say, their downfalls or, you know, this, that, like perfectionism, right? So what's interesting to me is you take people like Steve Jobs, right? Whenever he was starting Apple, people would say that he was obsessive about the fonts going into his computer and the design and how, the, you know, he wanted it to be seamless, minimal, and to really connect with people first and then kind of reverse engineered all the products to match that combination. Well, what's interesting is obviously, uh, you know, there's there's happy mediums between these, you know, obsessive points. But what's what I find interesting in your story and my story and a lot of other healers that I talk to is that these are the kind of triggers that you know we we see there's not a sustainability in these actions. And so what happens is is that over time we are forced to look internally at why we're obsessing so much and why we're caring so much. And through those observations and that inner eye, you start to see these things unravel and unfold. And in that unpacking is where all the treasure is, right? It's like, it's we're finding these gifts. And then once we have that faith to step out into that motion, to put it in motion, like you said, you started singing and these activations just started, you know, coming to you and like building upon. It's almost like the universe is saying, oh, you're getting it. So I'm going to, you're ready for the next step, my, my child, you know? And so it's like <laughs> on you, um, your true destiny and your true path. And when I talk to you, I definitely see that light and that spark and the charisma that you have. I never would have thought just a few years ago you were internally struggling with things because you're such a big figure and like even with your vocals and the amplification of what you're doing with sound it's just so um immense you know that it's really and you know like working on your music i can feel the changes in my body and the movement of energy um just working with you know doing all the back end stuff with with the album that we've been working on so i think this is a good segue to kind of transition into the album being one um and i would love to just talk about what that process was for you and taking the frequency voice and then having the accompany you know frequency music together and then, you know, we have uh, a track that is more engaging with some more upbeat music for the for the single. And then we have a deep meditation um, on there. And if you could just talk a little bit about that process and those two tracks, um, and then, you know, we'll move on to some other things. But I just thought this would be a good segue for that. Totally. Yeah, like the process has been fascinating because, you know, like, and maybe some, a little bit of backstory here is, is relevant because, you know, now I work with, down frequencies. And I remember when the listening to smile page was up and it was talking about all these different musicians. And it was the first time that I'd even considered myself as a musician. Um, because growing up, I would love singing, but singing wasn't something I had a particular skill set at. And I had memories, both in as a teenager and then in a relationship, but basically told you, but that's not sing or don't sing. Because, you know, if you want to attract women in the future, basically my partner had said, don't sing. And so it was like very strong, like, okay, you're going to shut that down. 
And it was only in some of the leadership work that I did that I started to just like expand my self-expression where I would just start to create songs and people start to be, respond in a, in a more positive way. So then I would get up on stage and I would start, you know, singing. And I wasn't under no illusions about the quality of my voice at that stage, um, but there was some ex freedom to express. And that same freedom, I think, has come through uh, with the way that I create sound now. Like when I talk to professional musicians, they'll say things like, oh, you've got perfect pitch. Um, or you'll say like, you've got this audacity to go for notes that normal musicians wouldn't go for because they've got all the training, <laughs> which would have them kind of go, well, that's not possible or whatever. Whereas for me, this is just effortlessly sort of come through. And the way the album was created was very much like this. So I remember when you were giving me these tracks to choose from and I'd be listening to them and I'd just be kind of feeling like, oh, does this one feel like it resonates with me? And, or, and some of them did, some of them didn't. And then when I first found one, I think the first one which did was the Thoughts and Feelings track, which isn't on this um, particular part of the album, but uh, on a larger part, that was the first time that I put my, you know, headphones on and then I started to record in GarageBand and it was one take. Um, and I just like literally got connected. I let the sound come through, I let the voice come through. And, you know, when I started to send it out to people like, whoa, this is potent, you know, and I wasn't expecting that because <laughs> for whatever reason, when I hear my own work, it doesn't have the same effect on me as it does on others. But yeah. that was a very exciting moment to go and be like, okay, like this is actually something which works. And then you get to hear the layering of it with the, in this case, like a 174 Hertz track. It was just like this extraordinary moment where it's like, oh, this is actually a professional product. Like, it's not just like a raw recording. It's like, this has actually come to life. And so with the actual single, um, you know, there were two pieces. One obviously was the um, the spoken word piece, which I had a lot of reservations about. And initially when I'm trying to like, you know, like make an affirmation. I'm like, mm, not kind of your affirmation guy. So that's probably kind of be a tricky one. And as I tried to think through like, what would affirmations be? Uh, it didn't really work. And so I had to kind of connect with something which made sense to me just about more like my philosophy on thinking about the world. And I'd recently been in Paris and, you know, even though there are so many extraordinary, you know, places you can go for great art, the place which really got my attention was something which is called the Iris Gallery. And there are multiple of them around uh, the world. I didn't know that at the time. To me, this was like the most unique thing in the world where you get to see all of these irises up close. And I was fascinated by it. And what came through was like, oh, this is really an expression of the way in which the illusion of separation gets to be broken apart. Because you could look at someone's eye and not truly know the color of their skin or anything about them. You could make assumptions, but you'd often be wrong. And so that's what inspired me to kind of create that first piece being one, which was just an expression of our humanity and where we often feel like we're separate and on our own, which was certainly what it felt like when I was going through all those challenges with my mental health. Uh, yeah. But it's also something that entrepreneurs experience all the time. They feel like they're on their own in different ways, especially as they go you know, higher and higher up the echelons, like they feel even more alone because no one else understands what it's like and all that kind of crap. But really, that's just the illusion of separation, right? And when we get to connect back with this. So that was the intention uh, with that particular piece. That's so cool. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, we'll get, to, I have another question to go into right there, but I would like to talk a little bit about the meditation track um, for sure. album before we go to the other question. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like um, that one's called Listening From Within. And mm -hmm. I remember you actually helped name it because I didn't have a name for it. And you're like, I've, I've named it Listening From Within because you actually just keep saying like, listen from within like multiple times. And I was like, oh, when I listen back, okay, cool, yeah. <laughs> and um, I was actually uh, playing that as the start of a facilitation for an event in Orlando the other week it was the first time like I'd used it within a professional setting. Yeah. And some of the people I was like, oh my God, that was such a profound experience. And they would share with me what had transpired. Because again, like I, I can't judge it, you know, like I've had a couple of different people go, oh yeah, this is cool. Um, but for me, it's a different kind of uh, experience. So when I was getting to hear that and especially the reworked version that you did, like I can remember like the emotion that I could feel, like I might not go into the spaces that others do, but I could connect with it at an emotional level. I remember like tears being in my eyes. Um, 
but once more, I think the way it was created was a very similar process. Like it's very much like I connect with the music. And as I connect with the music, I allow what words and what intentions and what sound frequencies come through. And I just trust it. And yeah. that particular track is different to some of the other ones I create because it's less about creating an emotional release and it really stays in a higher vibration uh, yeah. than others. Like a lot of my work is known for the way in which it can startle people <laughs> in a good way uh, where it can like, it's almost like a scream or a yell. It can sound like where it's like the safest way for someone to release certain emotions like anger, resentment, and frustration is through my voice. And, you know, like a lot of people feel voiceless about a lot of things. Like I work with a lot of people around things like sexual abuse. Um, and the other day, you know, someone I was working with a high profile leader and they basically, you know, I said, what is this energy feels like it comes from? It's like, oh, when I was 16 and this is what happened. And so we literally were able to help them free themselves to a point where they feel like they had their voice heard for the first time in 20 years through right. utilizing this technique so yeah. that technique can be super helpful but it's also when you're first introducing people to sound frequencies or especially the way i use it with nro it can be i think helpful to have a little softer approach in and so this listening from within track provides that but still takes people on a journey which can be expansive yeah i think that's man that's so cool i i think that's one of the biggest things that i resonate with with your work is the disruption and and what i mean by that is um paul check uh who's really known in the fitness community um i was lucky enough to get on his podcast and be a part of that stratosphere and um and talking with him you know and and just hearing him talk about the gym one of the things is is you are there to break down the old and rebuild the new. And that's not an easy process. And I think a lot of Western society likes to spiritual bypass things and really emotionally bypass things to get into this Zen state artificially. And there's just so much damage I feel that's caused in that space of bypass. And so when you're going to the gym, you are disrupting your nervous system a little bit, but there's there's good that comes from it. And it's like um, professionals like Paul try to help us to navigate doing that in a way that is beneficial and moves you forward. And I think you as a thought leader in this space of taking frequency into these spaces where you are working with elite CEOs and higher um, optimizations of energies, um, it's just very, very powerful, man, like how um, you can take something, show someone that this can become the superpower, this weakness or this, this trigger or this, this dark space in your life can actually be transformed. Um, and it makes me think of Greg Braden. Greg Braden had a book called Spontaneous uh, Healing, I think was the name of the book. And there's a chapter in there where he talks about belief code 21. And he basically was saying that this is a belief that whatever has brought you harm can be the thing that's transformative and bringing you the healing and the transformation. So like if food were something that was a negative thing in your life, you can also transform that vision and the perspective of how that can now be giving you life and be this, this powerful substance. And so I think you're showing people by uncovering with these vocal frequencies and these, um, and, I, and I think it's not just your, you know, from an outsider, I think it's not just your vocal, I think that's the initial, but I think it, honestly, Sam, the, the power of your personality and the personable side of you is it's helping people to trust and to let go and drop a lot of the, the charades and, and, and curtains that come down. And then when you put those powerful vocals in there, it's just really a cleansing space for them. So that leads us to the next question. You just recently came back from Egypt and the pyramids, and I saw one of the clips of the, the videos and it was truly, I was like, man, Sam's out there doing it. So could you talk a little bit about that trip and what came from that? Sure. Yeah, it was an interesting experience being uh, in the pyramids. 36 hours earlier, I was actually uh, ill. I'm not sure if it was food poisoning or something else, but um, I was, you know, <laughs> really struggling. And I actually, you know, I got to see one of the own imprints uh, that I offer language she may or not understand, but it's like a somatic thing where there's something where 
there's something which the way in which you naturally might deal with a situation is um, not necessarily working for you. It's a default pattern and it shows up within the energy of the body, but also then the actions that you take. And I didn't want to disturb people uh, with their sleep, you know, with a lack of sleep at that time. And I was staying in an Airbnb a couple of minutes away from most people's hotel. And I thought, no, it's late. I don't want to disturb people. I can handle this myself. And uh, after being ill for another 10 times in an hour or so, I realized, oh, fuck, I actually need some help. And I, I kind of had to, I remember having an internal conversation with myself, like, Sam, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you've got to reach out for help, right? Mm -hmm. And I was really seeing in that moment, like, oh, this is how you often be in life, right? Like, you're not really calling that into the next level. And I share that because even as you expand and things can expand very, very quickly, you can still realize that there's another level that you can move through. And for me, it was like, oh, this is an opportunity. Right? Like looking back and like, this was an opportunity to see like how much support is truly there. And within a couple of minutes of sending a message to the group, I had people sent, you know, get, getting electrolytes, medicine from the hotel, clean water, because Egypt, you know, you don't want to drink the water unless it's from a bottled source. Uh, and within 36 hours, I was able to be at least 75% to go into the pyramids at 5 a.m. and to deliver this brief meditation as part of my friend's 40th birthday. And it was a beautiful experience. Um, you know, the resonance that you hear when it comes around the walls, like a lot of the work that I do is often in spaces which have incredible acoustics because um, they really get to hear the way the sound bounces off uh, the room. And obviously being in a space like the pyramids and a, a burial chamber, which is quite small, uh, it really creates a beautiful space for that voice to be amplified. And, you know, well, like everything I do, it's very instinctual. So I get people to set an intention in that particular situation. And I remember bringing through a sound initially kind of create a clearing, which I think is a little bit of what you heard in like the 20 second clip. And yeah. then I would, you know, have people drop deeper. And then I would just start to allow what wants to come through. And I remember there were two kids in the room and I'd kind of given them some sense of like, you know, this screen could come through different things. But I remember the words wake up. Uh, coming coming through my voice in a very abrupt way, in a very loud way. Uh, and th their eyes were open, I remember, the rest of the time. Um, but it was it was powerful, right? People were in tears in a, in a positive way. Other people who'd never met me before, like, oh, it's like this energy was in the body and then suddenly it was released. And then others were like, oh, usually there's like two different voices kind of coming through. It was like this clear channel, uh, which was present for them. So it was, it was a beautiful experience. It's definitely something I'll remember for uh a long time and I, I keep getting these privileged experiences where I, I get to go to incredible places and you know do this kind of work it's well it's not even work for me it's for me it's very playful even though I work with very challenging topics for a lot of people for me it's still I take a very playful approach to it because um I find that actually creates a lot of ease and safety for people and a lot of trust yeah well, before we move off of the travel, so you just got back from Egypt, but earlier this year you went to Antarctica. Can you talk a little bit about what you went there for and kind of, because sure. I believe that you said that you got to do something like out on the ice, like with your voice, like you got to, you know, kind of really project it out there. So yeah, that'd be really cool to hear about if you're able. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Like that was kind of crazy because I never had a dream to go to Antarctica. Um, but it was March and I was doing an interview with a, a friend, fellow mentor, a guy called Aloka Paterai, and he was interviewing me about my business uh, and the work that I do. And I thought Aloka had already started the interview and whatever I'd said, it inspired something in. And he's like, oh, if there was an opportunity to go to Antarctica in March to be with 130 leaders who are out to shift the vibration of the planet, would you want to go? I'm like, yeah. So I was like, well, I can't promise anything, but uh, I've got a friend who's one of the co-organizers. Let me reach out to her and see whether there's a space. So wake up the next morning and I find there's a space to go to Antarctica. Looked at the price. It's like, all right, that's more reasonable than I thought. I can make that work. And uh, suddenly I find myself having booked in to go to Antarctica and having the overwhelm of what do I need to go to Antarctica? It uh, turns out it's a lot milder than you might think. So, you know, if you're ever thinking of going to Antarctica, don't make the mistake that I did, which is look up Antarctica weather, which will just take you to some space of weather station, God knows where, where it's like minus 50. It's more like, you know, minus three degrees to seven degrees in the summer was my uh, experience. Uh, or in, you know, American terms, like a bit under 32 deg degrees Fahrenheit to, uh, maybe like 45 uh, Fahrenheit. So, you know, 
pretty pretty okay and they give you the kind of gear that you need to be able to be fine but the yeah the experience of actually just testing out my voice on the ice uh i just had an impromptu moment was like oh it wouldn't be cool to kind of just allow the sound to come through being in this pristine space of nature so i did and then a couple of people captured it um and the people like started to tell me like oh i was feeling the resonance of that from like 50 meters away and that actually had people get more curious about what it is I do. And when I started to like impromptuly create, uh, you know, a group event, like 25 leaders showed up um, and, uh, you know, got to be able to really powerfully create a space for, you know, working directly with a couple of people, but created a shift in, I think, 24 of the 25 people, which was beyond my expectation. Because at the time, the largest group I'd worked with in person was four people at a at like a men's retreat. Um, so this was like an entirely new space, which shifted everything that I've been doing since. I think this is really important for our viewership to really per put in perspective, which is in the last year and a half to two years, you have skyrocketed and the experiences, the travel, um, and just the network of people that you're connecting with and able to help. And, you know, I know from meeting you in the beginning of the year to where you are now, um, massive monumental changes, just watching, you know, that evolution. And, and it's neat to be able to see that in the work that I do, you know, watching people evolve. Um, and I recently connected you with Tennille Bentley. And, you know, she's someone that we started working together in 2016. And she just released a documentary, probably going to be one of the greatest documentaries on sound that I've ever seen. Um, and it took her four years and she's been on this huge journey of expansion. And I think this is what sound does, right? So us as facilitators, we're watching people wake up. We're watching people expand and peel the layers of the onion. And um, we're really humbled by that work to be able to bring those frequencies to people in those different ways. And um, yeah, I mean, I just think it's truly amazing the work that you're doing. And I think even more than that, the amount of expansion that you've had in the last two years alone um, personally and business-wise is truly remarkable. So I think one of the things I always wonder is when people get to um, this type of, of work, what is it that really, what, like, what was your first taste heard music and you were like, yeah, this is it. You know, this is really what I'm, this is really what I'm wanting um, you know, in my life more and got you to kind of dive into to music. Do you remember what your first, you know, experience with music that really, you know, gave you that kind of compassion and passionate feeling about music, like when you were growing up? It's a good question. <laughs> the first thought which comes to mind, and I don't know whether it's what it would be, is like my parents coming back from seeing the musical in Sydney of the Sound of the Opera. Uh, and I, I definitely <laughs> tried singing that uh, soundtrack for you know, the next probably 25 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that was like the first kind of foray maybe into musicals or something like that. And I've always loved musicals as long as I can remember. So that was something which was a, a kind of a key component. Uh, but I loved like my parents had you know, my opinion, great taste in music, like Simon and Garfunkel records was something which was uh, played often and I absolutely adored. And then as I got a little bit older, I think like the Buena Vista Social Club, maybe when I was maybe early teenager or maybe even younger, that was something like the, that Cuban rhythm was something I really loved and resonated with. And I went to Cuba recently and I got to kind of hear that actual sound in person, which was really uh, a cool experience, um, despite all of the kind of desolation of the country itself, but like actually being in a space where you hear that music was was really powerful because it really connected me back with those moments in in childhood. Uh, I I do remember like not having like a preference for music growing up. Like it was initially whatever my brother was listening to was what I would be then trying to listen to, but I didn't have a a voice if you like in many ways in life and this was another way in which i hadn't really found my own voice uh so it it was a journey i guess into kind of appreciating music and the funny thing is um 
the first person, first album I think I ever got was either Leanne Rhymes Blue, so not your typical uh, album for a boy, or, yeah. or Celine Dion's, one of her, her albums uh, at like 11 years old. And um, now like one of my, you know, missions is to be able to support her uh, in, you know, overcoming stiff person syndrome because it's like well if it's neurological then a lot of the work I do is dealing with things at a neurological level so why can't I help her right and that's kind of the limitless audacious thinking that I've got nowadays where it's just like if I see someone who I think I can support and I'm like well let's just see if there's a way right rather than going well they're too far out of reach or is that really possible it's like well who knows right why not uh have the vision and then play for it anyway independently of whether it actually goes and happens right yeah so these days like now what do you find yourself gravitating towards the most is there a certain artist that you are like recently listening to that you're enjoying I don't think there is to be honest that I'm spending a lot of time like I spend a lot of time listening to sound frequencies yeah um so the artist Tom Kenyon uh, is not a singer as such. He's someone who challenges the energy of the Hawthors, which I didn't even know. I think that's related to ancient Egypt. I was in Egypt at one of these, you know, uh, I think it's called the Gem, which is like going to be the largest museum of artifacts in the world when it's fully opened. And I saw the Hawthors. I was like, oh, I think that's that thing that this guy channels. Yeah. Um, so I started to like connect with that. And I find his music quite uh, beautiful in terms of the impact for like I, there's a track around immunity for instance which whenever I have a sense that I might be uh, my immunity might be going down I listen to that uh, before I go to sleep to just kind of bring, bring myself back up um, so that kind of thing is something I really enjoy but I love music like I, I you know the more music I have in my life the the, the better like I you know when I was in Greece I think got Turkey the other week I was out uh, doing karaoke and I was singing uh, "Bring Them Home" uh, from Les Mis because a few weeks before I was in Boulder and uh, we broke past the story of Sam you know a singer with a, a professional uh, musician friend basically said I want to get you on the mic and I'd never been in a recording studio before he's got this beautiful sure mic and then he has like all this different equipment which creates the reverb and makes the voice sound cool and I started to sing and was like oh that doesn't sound too bad and then a kind of a couple of nights later we started to just test things out and we spent like an hour trying to record bring them home so when I got to a chance to a karaoke place I was like all right let me, let's just let this rip um and people I think were surprised of, of what came out um because you know I don't describe myself generally as hi I'm a singer or anything like that uh but yeah that's kind of what comes through like I'm not up to date with the charts or anything like that but there's a lot of music which I love and if it's something where I can connect with it rhythmically um then then all the better yeah yeah I think it's it's neat man like art has really changed a lot um you know music art poetry has really gone through a lot of transformations and um one of the things that we just did an article on um Andre 3000 in this past issue and, you know, he was in the band Outcast, you know, the group Outcast, and they had some really big chart topping hit songs. And um, he kind of stepped away from all that for a while. And he got into 432 Hertz and started playing flute. And he just recently put out an album with flute and a uh, very minimal like meditation album. And he made an accompanying video that's about an hour long that goes with the hour long album. And people are losing their minds because they don't understand why he's basically going against the mainstream. Like he put out something that is completely different from what he was doing. And when you look at his evolution as a person, it seems like he's been on a hero's journey and gone through some pretty transformative work, you know, with himself. And, um, and so I just always love it when people like you and just any artist or musician or, you know, creative steps into new territory. I think that's really, um, when you think about Jackson Pollock and the splatter paint, it's not really that it's a fantastic, amazing thing, but it's that he had the guts to do something that no one had ever really done before and step into exploring new territory. And I think those, that kind of um, innovation needs to be celebrated. And I think that 
a lot of times people forget in the business world how much the creative thoughts, the creative thoughts are influenced by our own ability to express ourselves creatively and how that can lead to these connections in the business world because we are freeing ourselves. We're becoming more untethered to these dark spaces. We're transforming them into these expressions. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, what you see in the work with the, you know, some of the upper echelon CEOs, kind of how you're seeing those blocks being transformed from your voice and kind of what that's leading to for, for their business? Sure. Yeah, I've got a client right now who's at the UN General Assembly, he was invited there. I remember like a few weeks ago, he, he's like, your magic is uh, paying off in all sorts of different ways. I just got invited to you know, come to the UN and, and talk about the work that I'm doing around sustainability and the future of the planet, but also the future generations that he's working with through his films uh, to be able to, um, to create that future. And I was like, wow. And then, you know, when you actually get into the going to the UN, like there's then the, like, what are you asking for? Like, what are you enrolling them in? So working on like any blocks there are around asking for what people, you know, what you really need. Right? Like if you've got this massive mission, you need resources, financial resources to be able to actually make it happen. And often there can be some level of ceiling where you've gone, well, I can ask for that, but can I truly ask for this? And so one of the things that I've been you know, renowned for is just the way I could shatter people's financial ceilings. So whatever ceiling they've created, like the game for me, like if someone comes to me and says, I want to create $100 million and say, okay, cool, let's play that game. Right, like it's just a number. It's just an energy. So my role is just to be able to work with them to understand what are the things which are blocking them from actually already having that, and then let's look at where that shows up from a generational perspective, from the, what how your parents were, your interactions with them, and then your own experiences as you've grown up to kind of clear each of these different spaces to create a stacking of light, which creates more intelligence within the body, so that the authenticity of you can actually come through and you can get connected with you know whatever is limitless, right? The abundance of energy, including the abundance of financial energy that gets to be created. So that's one space in which like CEOs uh, find this work extraordinary because you know, it doesn't matter, it seems how much someone's earned. Like even with billionaires, they often have different concerns around money from people just want their money, who can they trust, right? Uh, to what if I lose it all, so I still need more or that what's behind it is, I've got to still validate myself. I've got to prove something to someone else. So the accumulation of wealth is for that reason, not because they just need more stuff, right? And so it's like when you can clear that, something extraordinary happens. Like one of my clients is a global social impact uh, award winner, and they were about to step into a kind of different trajectory in the way that their business was. They've got a very successful nonprofit, which they're known for, but they were thinking about shifting into a different kind of trajectory with business. And so as we're working through these different hurdles, uh, we cleared a lot of the stuff which was going on at the business level, but something else emerged because we're able through the sound for them to rewrite their childhood, where moments where they had been seeking the validation and affirmation, which they never got, uh, they actually experienced it energetically and the people that they never experienced it from were suddenly literally there on the sidelines, clapping them as they got the awards, which they were removed from getting because of the people saying, no, you, we're going to take you out of that contest. We're not going to let you go for this to get this book award. We're not going to allow you to be put up on stage for this. So suddenly all these memories, which were traumatic, got erased or transmuted. And they were through the power and brilliance of them able to experience oh, this actually is what my journey is now. So it's like you can reverse your childhood energetically through sound frequency if you, you know, are tapped in enough. And a lot of the people I work with are very conscious leaders. So they do a lot of meditation and this like this. And that allows them to go to these different echelons and different spaces, which maybe someone who has never done meditation or breath work or anything else before might not get to as quickly, right? And my work is always meeting people where they're at, but that's one of the most powerful things. It's just seeing the way in which whatever audacious vision someone has through sound, sound is an amplifier of intention. You can both use it to clear anything that's within the body, but you can also use it to fulfill vision. And I think that's what people don't truly recognize is just like, imagine that the world was created through sound. Like that's certainly a, <laughs> one of the most plausible theories, whether it's the big bang or something else, like sound is a vehicle for creation. And yeah. if that's the most powerful vehicle for creation, why wouldn't we want to utilize it for creating vision as well? 
And so the process that I've created is a lot about creating vision. You know, we go through all the shit and the weeds of what's in the way, and then we come back to the vision and we use sound as an amplifier, an activator. And there's different kinds of sound frequencies I'll bring through depending on where they are in the journey. Sometimes yeah. the sound will be very high frequency and it's just allowing more light in and allowing more love because the connection with love connects with higher intelligence. But then other times it's like, oh, the sound that needs to come through is a bass sound, which kind of is a grounding sound and it goes all the way up through the body. Imagine like going through all the different chakras of the body and coming out through the crown. And in that experience, they start to see the visions of things. They experience it already happening. And then we get to walk them backwards in a way where they're now present to those different actions. So it's really practical of what to take to make it actually happen. So, you know, I've seen CEOs who literally have reorganized their company. where like, I need to hire these people and something. They go, actually, no, I don't. I can just kind of reorganize it in this moment. I said, well, how would you do that if you were um, going to do that outside of the session? I said, oh, I'd go to the whiteboard and I would you know, brainstorm how I could restructure and say, great, I want you to experience that now. So I'm going to bring through this sound. As I bring through this sound, I want you to talk me through the restructuring process. And so within two minutes, they've done that. Right? And I said, okay, now they can go and implement that. Because what the sound is doing is it's bypassing the thinking mind. So all the different solutions, which are already there from this idea of a conscious unified field are present. And so you can tap into that and then access these really high level strategies uh, in a way which wouldn't be available when you're just trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. You're helping them get out of their way. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So if, if someone wanted to find out more about your work, um, yeah. can you tell us a place where they can connect with you? And then are you actively taking clients? And then let's talk a little bit about your album. So if you could discuss your website, how they can get in touch with you, and then are yeah. you clients and just uh, address that. For sure. Yeah. So the website is Soul Purpose Leaders. It's Soul with S-O-U-L, not Soul Your Foot. Um, so you can find very easily through there. You can connect with me as well on social media. You know, if you're connected with me on Facebook, I recommend sending me a message so I know who you are because uh, you get a lot of requests on Facebook uh, and I don't always know who someone is. So I don't always uh, connect um, to be straight with you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn are the main places. There's a YouTube channel as well, which is under Soul Purpose Leaders. So those are the easiest places to connect. Most of the channels, I think, are under Sam Cookathus. Uh, and if it's not, it's under Soul Purpose Leaders. But you can find me easily through that. In okay. terms of the, the client piece, what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. Like, <laughs> the work that I'm looking to do is around impacting billions of lives across my lifetime. So there isn't, for me, a cap on uh, the number of people. There are just different ways in which to support people. So, you know, with the high level CEOs, there's a smaller number of people that I would work with. Um, but with the right people, we absolutely would, you know, be open to a discussion and, you know, look and see whether there's a synergy. Right? For me, it's always about, this has to be a synergistic relationship and partnership because we work with people for 12 months at a time, sometimes more. You want to really ensure that you both uh, feel at ease and this is going to be the highest uh, vibration for both of you. Um, so that's kind of what I'd say about that. With the other kind of work they do, um, so I have a program at the moment called Activate Freedom, okay. and we're exploring having this program be part of one of the largest uh, consciousness channels uh, on the planet. And so we're looking at people ex just experiencing uh, an initial offering of that and seeing whether that's something they want to go through on their own. So that's something you want to, you know, learn more about. You can reach out to me about that. I'm happy to share with you one of these sessions and you can just, you know, decide for yourself whether that's something you want to experience more. Um, and then the final thing is really the, the album, which is being uh, created, which is going to be a vehicle for something much bigger, right? Like the, the key mission for me is, okay, how do we use this technology in a way which allows for as many people in the world as possible to be able to experience it? Now, the first kind of product, which is probably coming out, is this uh, neuroresonance optimization meditation, which has been so powerful for CEOs. And one of the things that I've been very present to is CEOs often have a complaint about time. Uh, they're like, well, I don't have time for this, you know? And like, I think of like a CEO like Stephen Bartlett, who guy is the creator of Diary CEO, but is also an investor in a number of different companies. And his calendar is 
just chockers, right? Like you might see like 10 hours in a row blocked off for four podcasts in the US. Uh, his time is precious. So how do you work with someone like that? Well, you create something which is so dynamic and so powerful that within 16 minutes, they're in a space of effortless flow. Uh, they're able to connect with vision uh, and they've been able to remove you know, stresses from the body which are present within that day. And so that's what that meditation is designed for. And so it's going to start with having that meditation uh, be something people can subscribe to. And then it also be something which for those who want to have more in touch points to be able to create a sound circle where you know monthly CEOs can come and join and be able to experience uh, that together, both to hear the meditation, but also to work with me in some capacity throughout that session. So that's some of the things, uh, but we'll get into more to the to the bigger picture with the album. Um, but you know, I'll let you kind of respond before I kind of say more. Yeah. No. So we're going to put all those links and the video comment here uh, in the information there. We'll put all the links that you just spoke of um, so that people can easily connect with you that way. And then we'll also list ltsrecords.org. We will have a link to that so that you can link with Sam's single that he has put out, Being One. Um, yeah. And then as far as the work with, I mean, we're, we have multiple tracks that we're working with now and and even the talks of developing something you know much larger um because i believe that the work i'm doing um i create little uh, you know um symbols gongs tones tuning forks that have these kind of what i call note markers where they kind of are uh, transitioning people from pieces of the music and then things that are meant to disrupt and be um, kind of a, a, a peeling of that onion, you know, of a person's energetic levels. And so when your voice and the music comes together, I just feel like it's, it's really two things that were made for each other that are really working in harmony. Um, and I think that there's going to be a future where these line up in a way that, you know, can reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people um, in, in, a, in a larger way. And so that's what we're kind of, you know, talking about and developing now. And it's exciting. It's really cool. Totally. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go bigger. <laughs> and you know, I, I really think that this can impact billions. All right? Like the, the technology is that powerful that. You know why wouldn't we want as many people in the world as possible to experience it? I I don't know anyone who's experienced anything more potent than NRO. You know, my one of my missions is to have NRO be as well known as NLP within a year's time, uh, because it's what it's just more effective. Right? Like people say, oh, do you do use neuro linguistic programs? It's like, well, I used twenty years of being a philosopher, ten thousand, you know, tens of thousands of hours of pattern recognition of looking at the kind of the causes of things. Uh, so I think I naturally did what people call NLP. Uh, and then I brought transformative leadership to it and worked with some of the experts who've kind of shifted the way people thought for the last 50 years. And so all of that has become things which people already have a name for, but it's like, no, this, there's another way, right? Like there's a way which doesn't just shift, you know, the language in which you're using. We take the resonance of those words because imagine like every word has a resonance. So if you're someone who has high expectations, I'm someone who has high expectations of myself. You wouldn't talk about being someone who's looking to fulfill your limitless potential or uh, transform humanity unless you've had some sort of high expectations. There's likelihood that that didn't just come from you, right? Yeah. That there's a generational aspect to it. And sometimes high expectations can be great, but sometimes it can have a detrimental impact. And we want to be able to look at where is it that it's having a detrimental impact on your experience and clear that. So that's what's so beautiful about this. And we can work this multi-generational level, like the tone which comes through when something's ancestral sounds a lot for people like a, a tribal Native American Indian, but other times people describe it as, you know, like whale sounds because they grew up around whales and different things kind of connect with people energetically based on their own experiences and different sounds, uh, you know, are going to be heard in a different way based on those past experiences because what are we hearing where well, we're hearing based on some version of our past experience which creates some sort of connection and association to make sense of what's going on right yeah. so that explains why people have like oh it sounds like this or it sounds like that but you know the way that i truly see was possible with the work that you and i are doing with this platform is to create something which is a representation of all the challenges of the human condition 
you know, yeah. one of the tracks that you know we've created is called creating freedom from anxiety because the journey that i went on was one where for 28 years i described myself as having anxiety and then suddenly i discovered wait a second this was a story which was created as a three-year-old based on something which happened in a moment and then i felt i had to become more insular and so i did right as a way of responding to that situation and then i started to see like where are all the spaces in which having anxiety was actually like something i, I got something out of it as an identity and so i started to look at that and when i was creating this track i thought well what if we blended both what i used to do when i created a podcast where this was one of the you know the tracks people the uh not tracks but one of the episodes people really loved but also combined it with uh sound frequencies so that's kind of what i did i took some of my own experience and journey and then layered it with the sound frequencies. And then we've got the frequency minor music that you've got to create this kind of triple layering uh, of the, the voice, the kind of relatability, the sound frequency, and then the, the frequency minor music to create this harmony where people are both like getting to see like, okay, yeah, like you're just like me, <laughs> you experience this sort of stuff as well. Uh, and you're no longer kind of in that, right? And so I think it's aspirational in some respects, but it's also using the sound as a vehicle to shift things at the cellular level that's needed to not be in the story anymore. And the idea of it is not like someone listens once and I'm free. I've never experienced anxiety again, right? Like anxious feelings are normal, fear is normal. It's more about just shifting from an identity of, oh, I've got this, right? Like anytime we claim we have something, we create it as our own. And that can be something which is really powerful and positive, or it can be something which is really fucking detrimental. And part of the mission here around the mental health piece to kind of come full circle is to be able to shift that trajectory. And I think sound is one of the areas we can we can play a really key role in doing that. But it's it's not limited to those challenges. You know, we look at body image, we look at uh, people's relationship to sex intimacy, we look at finance, we look at the state of planetary systems, we look at climate anxiety, we look at the kinds of political legal systems. For me, the well that I'm looking, the lens I'm looking through is one in which it's possible to use sound to play a role in shifting each of the ways in which we perceive these systems and for sound to be a clearing for activating a new future in each of those, these spaces. Yeah. I think there's two things I want to speak on real quick. Uh, one is, isn't it interesting how everything in this perceived reality, and notice I said perceived, right? Because there's so much, you know, 99.999 <laughs> yeah, uh, free space here. But there's, it's so interesting to talk about sound and light pretty much make up everything that we know around us and the vibrations of those. And so when you're really getting down to a vibratory level and you're getting down to that core breakdown with people, there is a vibration that's present that is causing that stagnant energy. And something you said about the aspirations and the expectations um, really stuck with me because I started, you know, it, it got me on this, this thought pattern where I was focusing on the music industry, you know, back in the eight, seven, you know, fifties to the, you know, late nineties, they had it on lock, you know, they had everything that they needed. And because they lacked the innovation of seeing where technology was coming in and the role that it was going to play, they lost the industry to the tech industry. I mean, the tech industry is essentially running the music industry now, right? Um, because of the lack of vision or innovation in that space. And so I'm, I'm looking at a lot of things like where Web3 is coming in and there's so many people that are preparing and getting prepared and, and going into that innovative, creative space with it. And there's a lot of people that are like, ah, you know, that's not going to do anything. And you have this, this kind of separation starting again where these, you know, different companies are really fully stepping into that. And what it made me reflect on is how you were saying it doesn't mean that you have to have this certain uh, perfect idea of what it is. It's like really having that trust and moving into that space and watching that unfoldment. And it made me think about one thing in particular, and that is Michael Jackson was on the charts, top of the charts. And I'm sure he spends hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars recording these albums that he did. And the thing that made me really think about what you were saying is that nirvana, 
knocked off Michael Jackson as far as the top seat on the top 40 for America. And this band went into a studio with, I think I remember reading in an article, it was about $3,000 that they spent to record their first album. And then they got a little bit more money and got, you know, to a, a larger studio and recorded uh, Nevermind, their huge album. And it knocked Michael Jackson off of the charts. And this is coming from a band that was just recording in their garage that really had no aspirations of like world domination, but they just put out something that was so different and so innovative and had an energy to it that people started really gravitating towards it. And it, you know, knocked off one of the top seats on the charts. And I noticed that a lot of businesses that do these innovative things, they're really focusing on one thing, which is their passion and their joy. And then from that vibration, they're creating this ripple effect where other people are seeing what's happening and see their excitement. And they're just gravitating towards that normally. And so in conclusion, I'm just bringing this back around to say, I see that in you, Sam. I see the passion and the spark and that innovative um, trust that you're just stepping into fully. And I believe that's why you're having so much success and so many people are gravitating towards you is because you are just, you know, radiating and transmitting that vibration of passion and that spark of innovation that people want to be a part of, you know? So yeah, man, I just want to say congratulations on all of your success and I'm super, you know, honored to be working with you and I'm really excited to see what the future brings for you. Um, as well as, you know, in the partnership of the music that we're doing together, I'm just really excited, man. So I just want to say congratulations and, Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciated uh, having you on. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you, Ian. I, I, I really received everything you just expressed in the, you know, to a kind of a comparison with Nirvana and the kind of innovation of what is being created here is is powerful. Like Nirvana is definitely a band which had an influence on me as a, <laughs> growing up. And I, yeah, I remember the story of them kind of starting in a garage and, you know, like the recording of, of this album started off with a, I think, Audio Technica mic, and then you've kind of said recently, okay, you need to upgrade to the roads so that we're redoing some of the tracks to kind of create an even uh, better quality. Um, yeah. But the reality is like some of the raw stuff that I've created without even just our collabs, like I send off like this ancestral clearing track, which is six minutes and people are like, holy fuck, <laughs> like the space I just went in, like they're like, oh, this actually connects me with like the energy of Israel. Like there's someone in Australia and they're like dealing with all of the challenges of that, the war, everything's going on. It's like they're getting, you know, discoupling the energy of war from their system, which has been part of it from birth, right? And another person was like, they'd grown up in the Mormon church and they didn't choose that and they were leaving the church. And as they listened to the track, they got connected with their ancestors who were women who were in polygamous marriages, which they weren't really choosing. And they felt like they were stuck. And so that connection was clearing so that he could also clear what it was needed for him to be able to choose what he wanted next, right? And mm -hmm. to me, that's amazing. Like, all I did is open my mouth, sing some tunes, some notes, and then this is what goes on, right? So, yeah, it, it's wild to me. Like, the way I think of it is like, you've been like a conductor in orchestra where you get to witness this extraordinary creation come to life or like watching a movie and you're like eating the popcorn. Now, obviously it's not as subtle as that because I'm still making the sound and everything else, but it's, it really is like that. Like I really look and I'm like, holy fuck, did that just happen? Like did yeah. that person go to a space where they cleared the whole, you know, financial consciousness they had before because they connected that this was tied to all of Ireland's poverty consciousness. And then from that space, they got connected with an ancestry of like a king. And so they stepped into the energy of a king and dissolved the previous beliefs around money. Like, these things are wild, um, but that's that's what makes this such a joy to experience. It's just the, you get to see people transcend any kind of reality and understanding of who they've been, uh, and I'm just getting there to witness it. So, yeah, it's it's a privilege, and I'm super excited for what we're creating together and, and just the impact it's going to have on the world. Yeah. 
Dude, thank you so much for being here today. I'm hoping that this uh, podcast people find inspirational and make them step into their own trust with their personal potential and their innovation and their creativity. Um, and so thanks so much for the work you're doing. And just for everyone watching uh, in the uh, comments below, you'll see the links to all of the ways to connect with Sam and also the music. And so we appreciate your support. Um, and just thanks so much for being here. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ian.